Hey, you remember when I said I was going to make that year-end best list for 2019? Do you? It probably, probably not, but chances are uh, you're a new viewer, and welcome, if so, I'm sorry to have made such a terrible first impression. No, wait, please don't go, please stay. I, I feel like I definitely said that in a video, but I don't remember which one, because I don't go back and watch these things. But yeah, there's a very important reason I never actually ended up making that video. I was depressed. Yeah, go figure. Well, luckily, or tragically, because, uh, you know, Oof. We lost an entire year, so I guess I get to talk about that now. But obviously I'm not just going to do that whole list now. I, I will talk about a few of those towards the end, just some movies I want to recommend. What I will do is I'm going to talk about the movies I saw this year. Just a heads up, I will refer to 2020 as this year throughout the video. I would like to say I shot this in 2020, but I did not. It's not really going to be a best or worst of because, well, I, I didn't see that many movies, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I wonder why! I'm not gonna do the worst of list that I had planned because honestly, you know, it's... Uh, I, I don't, I don't wanna... I didn't see too many things in 2019 that were that bad. Although I will say my number one pick was The Haunting of Sharon Tate, which is a truly repugnant movie that has no merit whatsoever. This person, these, these people, they're a threat to my safety and to the safety of my baby! Oh my God. And Laquisha would be an honorable mention. I, that, that would probably be the number one movie, except I didn't watch it, and I never want to watch it, and I'm never going to watch it, and you can't make me. What was that? I think I might be a black woman trapped in a white man's body. Hey, stop! I, why? Yeah, nothing else I saw was really that bad, but those two specifically can burn in hell. So, yeah. Positivity. Woo! Let's do this. What's the first movie we're talking about? Sonic, son of a bitch. <laughs> No, oh, wait, I saw Birds of Prey first, ha! Now it's no secret I haven't been impressed by a lot of DC's film output. However, lately they seem to have figured out how to make movies that are capable of recreating that DC aesthetic while also being colorful and fun. Maybe they can keep this up and we can even get a fun Flash movie. Did you want to fight? Is that the deal? Whoa, bro, 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 bro. Or another fun and colorful Aquaman movie where Mira says this. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. you I don't know what you. the motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. But at least we got rid of Jared Leto, right? I mean, just in time for him to ruin the next Tron movie. Haha, <laughs> the future sucks and I hate it here. I honestly don't have too much to say about Birds of Prey other than it's like good Suicide Squad. We haven't seen too much of the James Gunn Suicide Squad. And? Yes, very good. Definitely appears to be doing its own thing. Th this movie feels like if you took the aesthetic of the existing Suicide Squad, but, you know, actually wrote a movie with that in mind and then shot it to, you know, accompany that, and then you edited it to be that way specifically, and then you put it on the screen and then people watched it. Pretty much everything that didn't work about the existing Suicide Squad movie is what works about this one. The characters are really great and fun to watch, even those who are barely on screen. Jared Leto isn't there. The humor feels much more organic and not like it's shoehorned into the movie. Jared Leto isn't there. The music choices aren't obnoxious and the movie doesn't look like somebody just threw it up onto the screen and Jared Leto isn't there. It's a hell of a lot easier to understand what's even happening and I think Ewan McGregor actually makes a really great black mask. I'd say he feels more genuinely unhinged than Jared Leto is Joker. Yeah, yeah. How, how's that feel? Uh, he, he didn't have to disappear into a rabbit hole or, or mail people dead rats or condoms or fuck with everybody on set except Viola Davis because for some reason you were scared to fuck with Viola Davis maybe because she uh, flat out said that her husband would have uh, solved the problem uh, r really quick. I, I think Viola Davis basically confirmed that if Jared Leto tried to fuck with her, her husband would kill him. That's amazing. I'll just go live in a fucking cave somewhere. <laughs> Wait, but what's that? He actually did go live in a cave. What? Wow. Twelve days ago I began a silent meditation in the desert. We were totally isolated. No phone, no communication, etc. We had no idea what was happening outside the facility. I don't know how to react to that. Ah, the lights are so bright in here I'm crying. Ah! I'm gonna just fuck my shit up eyes for the rest of this. So yeah, I don't know how much of a stirring endorsement it is to say that this is better than a pretty bad movie, but if you watched Suicide Squad and saw glimmers of what a more consistent production might yield, this is a good realization of that. And that's not to say it's perfect, actually structurally, uh, no, and not, not good at all. It does that whole freeze frame, bet you're wondering how I got here, you know, type thing. It does that way too many times, and it, it honestly feels very pointless, and it feels like you could 
probably cut a half hour out of the movie if you just did it chronologically. Yeah, that does sound like a major issue if, if you're not into that whole sort of Deadpool quirky, like just like, oh, how'd I get here? I'm, I'm gonna tell you now and the whole story's gonna unfold. If you don't like that, you're probably not gonna like this, but if you can stomach it, this is not the worst realization of that type of style at all. <laughs> But honestly, I had a lot of fun with this one. It has a lot of creative action scenes, which I'd say is DC's advantage over Marvel. They actually let the directors do cool action. And a lot of great moments, too. Hey, son. Yeah. Ah! It also tells you the movie was written by a woman, or at least somebody who has long hair, because as someone who has long hair, that, that shit, just fighting in that would be a goddamn nightmare. Like, I can't even keep it out of my face when I'm eating. I've eaten my own hair. I didn't want to. Part of the problem with Harley is that her, her origin and all that stuff is so tied to the Joker that a lot of times you sort of have to jump through a lot of hoops to sort of give her something to do in her own call. And some writers have done it fantastically. And I would say this doesn't do it as well as the show, you know, the animated show, which you should definitely go watch because it's really good. It seems like political like, correct culture is killing the comedy. For a two or so hour movie, this, this, th that works. It feels, well, you know, words are hard, man. A little rough in places, but overall I liked it. If we're ranking all the recent DC movies, I'd say it's probably like my third favorite. So take that for whatever you will. Also, it led to Grace Randolph trying to argue with Kathy Yan about content that was cut from the movie. I should probably let you know that Kathy Yan is the director of the movie and Grace Randolph is a YouTuber whose main function seems to be hating Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain destroys everything she touches. When it comes to Molly's game, the only real problem with the movie is that Jessica Chastain is smack in the center of it. <laughs> Bam, there she is. And I was like, I can't believe my luck. Jessica Chastain is not only opening this trailer, but as it turns out, occupies a decent chunk of it. Thanks for every single person who says, leave Jessica alone, Grace, like sometimes pretty, pretty, um, pretty aggressively. And on Instagram, Jessica Chastain posted this long rambling, uh, discussion of a double rainbow. And you're like, try to roll on Jessica Chastain. She maybe, maybe has the biggest, I don't know, footprint you might say, but her box office numbers are just absolute crap. She's naturally angry and in a bad mood. So how do I get out? That's how I'm gonna feel that But that said, she did a good job as a villain. I think it lines up with her actual personality. Man, some people are just so obsessed with their hate crushes. It's sad, really. Jared, Jared Leto, Leto isn't, isn't there. there. Moving on, and now it's time to talk about Sonic. And to save time, I'm going to do it in the style of Sonic, or at least how I think Sonic should talk, which is more or less the Micro Machines guy. Do you guys know who the Micro Machines guy is? I, I, I that's honestly outside of my like frame of reference. I, I know it more through content I've consumed from eras that I didn't, I was not alive for, I was not a part of. I, I'm probably gonna cut all this shit out of the video, what the fuck am I doing? Sonic was alright, not really my thing, clearly not aimed at someone my age anyway, and the things that annoy me about it probably won't annoy the people that the movie was actually made for, and that's fine. The, the Micro Machines guy sounded like that, but he could do it better. It, like, I'm not gonna act like that's not impressive, but it, it's like, you, you just go around telling people, it's like, oh, what do you do? I, I talk fast. I talk really fast. You, you get that one fucking annoying guy from Transformers? I'm him. I'm basically him. I, I know I'm gonna go f start fucking editing this video. And I'm gonna look up the Transformers movie. And I'm gonna find out that the Micro Machines guy actually was that fucking guy. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what happened. It's a perfectly passable generic E.T. type movie that would have absolutely nothing remarkable about it if it weren't for the fact that our first exposure to it was this. <laughs> Gotta go fast. And then I see people saying that this was planned from the start? Uh, what? No, no, I assume people say this because like, oh, how could these, you know, powerful and intelligent movie executives get something so wrong? How could they think this would be appealing? But uh, let me clear this up. Execs have terrible ideas all the time. It seems to be their bread and butter. If you look at the onset photos, the stand-in model that they use is definitely that first Sonic design. 
this was not planned. They had to bring in another VFX house to touch up Sonic, and they put in so much work that they couldn't recoup the loss, and they had to close down that branch. By the way, thanks to Race to the Bottom VFX deals, VFX are getting worse and worse, and the treatment of people is getting worse and worse because they have less time to work on it. It's actually not uncommon to see VFX are sleeping under their desk, and all for a job that could just stop existing because of one bad project. Also, Jim Carrey is in this movie, and I have never met Jim Carrey, so I can't really say I hate him, but Tommy Lee Jones has met him, and he hates him, and I trust that man. I wanted to find the most meaningless thing that I could come to and join, and, uh, and, uh, and here I am. Hey, speaking of the most meaningless thing, thing, let's talk about New Mutants. I got nothing for this. It honestly doesn't even seem fair to, like, critique this because this this really isn't a finished movie. It's established that a lot of big movies like this start with a sort of weak script and basically touch it up along the way through reshoots and other stuff like that. Actually, apparently, Iron Man 1, The Avengers, and The Force Awakens all started shooting without a completed script. When you think of it that way, it's a miracle that any of these movies are watchable at all because at one point they were all probably as boring as this. It just feels like it's missing things. The story is fairly predictable and unambitious, but it didn't feel like a total waste of time, you know, there's some fun to be had and some neat visuals and some very unfinished looking visuals, but definitely not the worst X-Men movie, but that is not a high bar to clear. All the actors are doing a pretty good job, but giving them cartoon accents was a bit of a weird choice. I would do anything to change that. Ah, shit, I gotta talk about Devil all the time again, don't I? Was a delusion that it would have kept him from saving it. I already have a video on this, but that's just a snippet from the podcast I do with Steve. A, B, P, always B, plugging. Uh, so I just sort of like to collect my own thoughts here very briefly, but you should go watch that video. It's good, it's, it's a video. This was disappointing. The cast of this one was amazing, and I, I even watched Antonio Campos' previous movie just to get a feel for his style, and I was sad for a week, so that's nice. But it's just so... Strange? Everybody sounds like Foghorn Leghorn, except for Robert Pattinson, who sounds like Joe Exotic. I'm not changing the way I dress. I refuse to wear a suit. I am gay. I've had two boyfriends most of my life. It's a certain type of structure I'm personally not a fan of. The closest thing I can compare this movie to is Place Beyond the Pines. I'm all for movies that change the POV characters and keep things fresh and exciting, but it, both these movies just sort of drop the ball for me. Everybody's doing a great job. I mean, Robert Pattinson sounds like an alien trying to imitate human speech, but he's putting in a good performance. Tom Holland's great. I honestly really like him as a performer, and I think he's got a decent amount of range. Jason Clark, Riley Keough, Bill Skarsgård, Dudley slash the guy with no arms, and legs from Buster Scruggs, they all do great work. The direction's really nice, and unlike Place Beyond the Pines, I do think that the story sort of comes back around and ties everything together really nicely, but there are two major issues that hold me back on this one. Firstly, it's too long. I think you could legitimately cut the Sebastian Stan character from this movie, and the movie would be better off. I don't think that character really adds anything. Secondly, the narration is just ridiculous. You know, I know, it's the guy who wrote the book, and it's cool that they got him, and he's got a great voice and everything. Thing, but it just feels like they took the entire text of the book and put it in the script. Like there's even a part where he announces speaker tags. Like this is a visual medium. We can see who's talking. You know, here, let me let me show you this. This is what this reminds me of. Ah, oh God. Yeah, I've been I've been I've been sitting on the floor this whole time. And my God, it fucking hurts. So I want to show you something. This is uh, I Am Legend uh, by Richard Matheson. Uh, it's it's the uh, short story, except somebody has put it in to a comic book form. A as you can see here, it's just the entire text of the book. Why? If you took like the best book ever written, I don't know, uh, the game by, I don't even want to say that as a joke, fuck. I don't know, I haven't read Devil all the time, so for all I know, this is completely different, but based on the summaries I've read and the people I've talked to that have read the book, it sounds like this is pretty damn close. In my opinion, if you're going to adapt something, it's good to do your own thing with it. Kinda like I'm thinking of ending things. Oh boy, many sads. <laughs> This is a really depressing movie. I don't think it's too hard to understand. I think you can kind of get it your first time around, but when you sit back and really think about it, 
and, and really like peel back the layers. You, you arrive at the saddest answer possible. I wanna give anything away with this one because it's really fun to unpack and talk about with others. The performances are all great and Charlie Kaufman is really great at creating these incredibly awkward and eerie moments. It's definitely not for everyone, but I really liked it. If you like movies that have you saying, what the fuck was that every five seconds, then you'll probably really enjoy it. Lightning round, all the movies I really don't have much to say about. An American Pickle. Disappointing, but Seth Rogen's really good in it. We can be heroes. I watched this mainly to see if it was bad movie touch material, and it wasn't. Honestly, more watchable than Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Possessor. It was all right, you know. I honestly prefer the theatrical cut. I don't think the uncut version really adds that much. And finally, Mulan. <laughs> oh boy. Um, this one made me laugh quite a few times. Not when it was trying to. Actually, that's uh, some of the few times it didn't make me laugh. But when it wasn't trying to, ooh, God, it's just, it's comedy gold. <laughs> no! 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 <laughs> Now let's talk about the only movie I saw in a theater this year, or uh, at a theater in a in a car. It was it was a drive-in. Tenant. We're gonna be talking about Tenant. It was fine. Moving on. No, really, it's fine. Perfectly fun action movie with some interesting setups for cool scenes. Perfectly serviceable performances and a script that gets the characters where they need to be for the things to happen. Ludwig Göransson really knocks it out of the park with the score, and I actually really like Elizabeth Debicki's character in this. I mean, not enough to remember her name, but then again, I only remember Maul's name in Inception because Leonardo DiCaprio shouts it so many times. Oh, no! This next one made me cry. Soul is good. Like, really good. Like, really good. Now, you know, I haven't seen many of the recent Disney Pixar movies, but this reminded me what I really love about them when they're on their A-game. The voice performances are great, and the animation is absolutely amazing. Plus, it's funny, like legitimately hilarious in places. It, it actually really made me fall in love with New York again. You know, of course, until I remembered all the times I've had to drive into that goddamn anxiety island. It's also really great if you love jazz. Uh, you know, the, the movie's not purely centered around jazz, it's just that the main character is a jazz player and, and a music teacher and stuff like that, and I'm happy that the movie does more stuff outside of that but the jazz scenes are really great you can tell that's like a huge love letter to the art form and just the colors and the sound it's just so perfect those scenes are great i love it yeah i, I really can't suggest it enough uh, go go watch soul I, I i really quite enjoyed that oh looks like i only got one more movie that i want to talk about so now i think is a good time to take it back and let's talk about the movies from 2019 or two of them the, i'm don't worry, I'm only talking about two of them. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was shooting a video for the 2019 list and, and then I think I took a break in between and then I just never came back to shoot the second part of it. And that's a shame because that might have actually been a decent video. I mean, I, I don't really remember and this is the only clip you're ever gonna see of it, so judge for yourself. Must be the brain mode. <laughs> I hope it didn't pick up me laughing. But the list I would have used you can find right here on screen. Of those movies, the two I really want to talk about are villains and the art of self-defense. You know, I'm not going to be the hundredth person in a row to tell you Parasite's great. You can see it right there on screen. But these two movies, for whatever reason, just seem to escape conversation entirely. Like, I heard some people talking about art of self-defense, but villains, I saw like one trailer and then next week it was already gone out of theaters. Like, I, I, I completely missed that one. Side note, why, like, when, when I was looking for a way to watch Villains, you could buy it on Amazon, like, in a physical copy, but, like, all the reviews were like, The Blu-ray does not work. First off, let me say I love this film. When I saw it in theater, when my first copy arrived, I tried watching it on my PS4. But play. I looked at the back of the disc. It does not look like any other typical Blu-ray I have. The movie is amazing. The Blu-ray is blank. I could tell something was wrong as the Blu-ray logo on the case is extremely fake. Disc is blank. No info and it is a BDR recordable disc. No title. No picture at all. Just black screen and silence. Not a legitimate copy. May not work. You can see from my photos that the disc is likely burned and the case it came in is closer to a PlayStation 4 case. Which is ironic because it doesn't work at all on my PS4. The disc could be empty for all I know. Not so much. I must be too old for this movie. Thought the acting G was terrible. I know that one doesn't have anything to do with the Blu-ray situation, but I just wanted to put it in here because I actually really agree, you know? The whole second act is in, like, G major, and it's just... We're gonna be talking about villains now, because I was really looking forward to this one, and, you know, you know, the trailer piqued my interest because, well, it had a lot of 
color, you know, it's like pinks and yellows, and you know, color stands out to me, and then you know, you call it Villains, and I think at the time I was listening to the Queens of the Stone Age album Villains. So I don't even so I was really looking forward to this, and then, like I said, I heard like next to nothing about it, and it was just gone. And, and I kind of get why. Villains is a very small scale movie. It's set almost entirely in in the one house, but you know, it has a great cast and it has an incredibly brisk pace. So I think that keeps the audience engaged throughout the entire thing. And it, it feels very tense at moments, but it can also be incredibly comedic. The ending is admittedly a little corny, but then they immediately cut to an awesome title sequence set to pedestrian at best by Courtney Barnett, so I didn't care once that started happening because I'm, well, fuck yeah. Art of Self-Defense is another great little movie that feels very unexpected, but it's anchored by just, again, some fantastic performances. I actually really like it when Jesse Eisenberg plays these weird, awkward characters that can also get incredibly violent. It feels very authentic. What can I say? The man looks like he's chopped some people up and eating them for dinner. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. Please don't kill me, Jesse Eisenberg. I loved you in the double, and again, in the double. The director's previous film, Faults, is also a great little micro-movie that I would really recommend. Actually, I think I, I have, oh, what well, you know? It's right here. Yeah, this is pretty good. Go check that out. And yes, here we are. We've arrived at the last entry, the best movie of 2020. What's that? This wasn't a ranked list? Oh, thank God. I'd probably get crucified if I said this was the best movie of the year. I liked Wonder Woman 1984. Like a lot. It is absolutely ridiculous. Like, it's part Quantum Leap, part Richard Donner Superman, part 1950 serial, part Apocalypse movie, part, I, I don't know, cocaine? This movie has been getting trashed, and I totally understand, because this feels like a canon movie that got an insane budget. For those of you who aren't aware, canon made this. <laughs> Oh, uh, and this. And, uh, this. So that should tell you what it's like. I can understand how changing things up that much from the first movie can alienate some people, but I didn't like the first movie, so I thought this was dope. I honestly think what I like so much about this is it fixed pretty much every issue I had with the first movie. The action's a lot better. They hardly ever use slow-mo, or at least they don't use it for every single fight scene like the last movie. It doesn't feel like a carbon copy of a better movie. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's, you know, like every movie made in the past few years, there's referential stuff and homages to other movies and, and all that stuff. Why did I say the past few years? Movies have been doing that since the dawn of time. The plot isn't like any other superhero movie, honestly. This is, this is batshit insane. The villain turns himself into a wish-granting rock. I'm not making that up. But most importantly though, as to why I liked it, the movie doesn't shit on its own message in the last act. That's not to say it has like a world shatteringly original message or even the most perfect execution up until that point. But the point of the matter is they set up a message and by the end of the movie, that is the message that the movie like stands by in some way. That's a lot better than the first movie being like, hey, come on, Diana, you can't just kill one guy and end the war. And then a few minutes later being like, hey, there's the guy you gotta kill. I think I think even fans of the first film generally agree that the last act of the other movie is not very good. It just overall feels like something that Patty Jenkins didn't want to do. This movie 100% feels like something she wanted to do, for better and worse. I totally understand why most people didn't like this, but to me, it felt like the ultimate showcase of what DC should be. Dumb as shit and not afraid to own it. I'm tired of, oh, we gotta make it dark and serious so people can accept it. This is the darkest and most serious and most mature thing. Mom, get out of my room! I really hope that that was a good take cause I'm not gonna be able to make it through many more of those. It just felt really great to see a superhero movie where the superhero actually saved people and nobody died. I'm, I'm not even joking. That's it's it's amazing that I have to praise a movie for like going out of its way to do that. But it's like, oh, cool, a hero that doesn't just show up and just fly people through walls or just destroy an entire city because he was having a bad day. Oh, look at that! Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of issues with this movie. Like uh, the weirdness. Uh, like I love weird movies. I do think the weirdness here sometimes comes at a massive detriment. It feels way too long. You could probably cut out the, the movie. Like starts twice and you can cut out that opening and, and not really miss much. Also, there's this dummy, which is the fakest thing I've ever seen, and just so much of the dialogue. It's just so overwritten and cheesy. But 
that all added to it for me. Like, I always prefer a giant swing and a miss than something that's completely playing it safe. Like, this movie is not playing it safe at all. This is like, listen, uh, people saw the first one, people really liked it, we're just gonna do whatever the fuck we want. And I, I really like that. As a filmmaker, that's the type of movie I'd want to make. That's the type of thing that it's fun to work on, because you can just kind of be you and like put it all out there. But, long story short, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. Didn't enjoy the first one, quite enjoyed this one. So if you're looking for a recommendation, if you didn't like the first Wonder Woman movie, then maybe you'll like this one. Uh, and if you like the first one, then you probably won't like this one. And uh, it's entirely possible that you didn't like the first one, and you'll see this and you, you won't like that either. But, I mean, I liked it, so take that for what you will. And honestly, it's under Shazam for my favorite recent DC movie. I, I didn't start shooting here to just keep pulling these out. It's just helpful, and they've all been in arm's reach thus far, so. But I don't want to close things out on a big movie like that. No, no, no. I want to drive your attention to something that not as many people saw and, you know, give something smaller the spotlight. So that's why, to close things out, we're actually going to be talking about the Russell Crowe movie Unhinged. Why didn't more people see this movie? Like, it's criminal. Like, I, I mean, hell, I didn't even see it. It was, the, I paid to, it was the second movie on the ticket at the drive-in, but I left before that because I had like an hour drive home. What's it about? Russell Crowe goes crazy and just starts beating up people? Is it a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> What was I doing? Thanks so much for watching, guys. I honestly wasn't even sure if I was gonna do this video, but it felt really good to write something like this again. So uh, if you liked it, be sure to leave a like on it down below. You can also comment down below, just let me know what you thought of any of these movies, or maybe just give me a recommendation for something to watch. If you like my stuff and wanna see more of it, well then you could be sure to subscribe, and if you wanna help me make more of it, then you could head on over to Patreon. You can get some cool perks, like your name on this end screen here. Uh, here are all my socials. Be sure to go check out Pitch Shift, the podcast I do with Steve. Thanks for watching this and congratulations on making it through 2020. Uh, hopefully 2021 will be the year that we can finally release the Frozen Run. I hope to see you in the next video. I mean I won't see you. You'll see me if you come back. I hope you do. I don't always know how to end the video. I I'm gonna put a link to where I got this hat uh, down below if you like this design you like this little saying not all sense is common uh, this is uh, clothing made by my uncle Lewis and uh, it's really good stuff he also has like phone cases and like hoodies a bunch of stuff uh, so uh, go check that out because uh, I, I actually really like this hat it's very warm and I actually do get quite a few compliments on it so go check that out if you like this and tell him Andy sent you I, I don't I mean, it won't do anything, but he'll know. He didn't tell me to do this, by the way. I just, this is good stuff, so. Go, go do that if you want. I don't know. Goodbye. And to grab a pillow. Cause, ah. Oh, that's so much better. I'm not gonna go off on a huge tangent about this, obviously, but I do think it's really funny that out of the entire cast, Jared just didn't fuck with Viola Davis, it, you know, because I, I don't think that the Joker would really care who he's fucking with. I think he'd just kind of do that indiscriminately, you know, no matter who, who's in the cast or whose husband, you know, might beat the shit out of you. So I, you know, I think that really stands to say that he, he did really disappear into that rabbit hole, you know? It totally wasn't just an excuse to act like a prick. What the fuck?